Okay. So have you ever felt like, you know, sometimes the universe is like one big messy room. Hmm. I know that feeling. Like, yeah. where are my keys? Where's that thing I was just, <laughs> right? you know, I was like, where is it? Well, get this. Physicists actually have a way to measure that messiness. No way. It's called entropy. And today we're diving deep, deep, deep into this whole idea of entropy. And we've got some really cool insights from a theoretical physicist, John Baez. He's got a book on it. Oh, cool. And gets the book actually started as a series of tweets. What? Yeah. yeah. So all this mind-bending yeah. physics uh -huh. somehow condensed into those little 280 characters or whatever they're up to now. I love how he does that, though. You know, Baez has a way of taking these really abstract concepts and making them, like, strangely relatable. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. He starts with this idea of, like, picturing a messy room versus mm -hmm. one that's perfectly organized. Okay. And he asks, like, which one would actually take more information to describe completely? Just think about it for a second. Mm, the messy one. Yeah, yeah. you got it. Yeah. Because with the messy one, you got to be like, okay, the book is under the sock and the lamp is, you, you know. You just have to describe where every single thing is. Exactly. Every little detail. Every sock out of place, you name it. So that, my friend, is entropy in action. But instead of dealing with messy rooms, we're talking about the microscopic state of, well, everything. Right. But today, we're going to really hone in on something specific just to make it really clear. Yeah. A single hydrogen molecule at room temperature. And what Bayes wants us to understand is that, get this, a single hydrogen molecule has about, are you ready for this? 23 bits of missing information about its state. 23 bits. 23 bits. Now, I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, hold on a second, my hydrogen fuel cell car, that doesn't seem that complicated. Right, exactly. But trust me, there's a whole lot more going on at that molecular level than meets the eye. So our mission today is to unpack what those 23 bits really mean. We're going deep into information theory, statistical mechanics, all that fun stuff. All connecting back to, you know, that cup of coffee you might be enjoying as you listen to this. Exactly. Exactly. It's all related. Yeah. So we usually hear that entropy is about things being disordered, but it's more about how much information we're missing about a system's state, right? Okay. Yep. The more ways those molecules could be arranged, the more missing information there is and the higher the entropy. Okay. Okay. I'm with you on that whole missing information idea, but how do we go from a messy room to like actual numbers, equations, those 23 bits? How do we even measure mything information? Where do we even begin? Well, that's where the work of Claude Shannon comes in. He's considered the father of information theory. Okay. Ever played those license plate games on road trips? Oh, absolutely. Trying yeah. to find like the license plate with the most consecutive numbers or something. Exactly. Or making words out of the letters. So those games, they all come down to the amount of information packed into those seven letters or numbers, right? Yeah. A license plate that's all A's, like A, A, A. <laughs> Pretty boring, right? Okay. Low information content. But if you've got one with like seven of Z8 Q5, you're like, ooh, now we're talking. Right, right. High information license plate. That's high value, high value right there. Exactly. And Shannon figured out how to actually measure that information content, and it all comes down to, you guessed it, probability. Okay. The less likely something is, the more information it contains. So a license plate with all A's is very likely if you're only picking from the letter A, yeah, but super unlikely if you can use any letter or number. Exactly. And that difference in probability is what helps us understand information. And Shannon's work gave us a way to measure it in bits. And that's what's so mind-blowing because this isn't just some abstract theory. Like mm -hmm. Shannon's work, that's a foundation of our entire digital age. It's how we measure information in computers, how we send data efficiently, all of it. Crazy, right? It's amazing. But how do we go from these license plates to hydrogen molecules? How does information and probability translate to like actual physics and these 23 bits? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. Bayes introduces this principle that sounds a bit paradoxical at first, the principle of maximum entropy. Okay, hit me with it. What's so paradoxical about it? Well, it essentially says that when we're faced with uncertainty, the best guess is the one that admits the most ignorance. So like with the license plate example, I should assume it's the most random jumble of letters and numbers. Exactly. You're making the least biased assumption, right, given the information you do have. And this principle isn't just about license plates. It pops up everywhere in physics. We can use it to predict how gases behave, think about black holes. It's wild. Okay, I need an example here. Yep. I need something to help me wrap my head around this whole admitting ignorance business and how it connects to something 
you know, real. All right, picture this. You found a die, but it's weighted. Okay. It's a bit sus, you know? Yeah, rigged. <laughs> no, it's not fair. But the only info you have is that the average roll is 4.5. Hmm. Interesting. So it could be like four and five all the time or something. Or maybe it's like a more complicated setup. Exactly. There's tons of ways to weight it and still get an average of 4.5. But the principle of maximum entropy, remember that? Yeah. It yeah. says we got to go with the weighting that's the most spread out. Okay. The one that doesn't make any assumptions about which numbers are more likely, you know, beyond that average we already know. So we're like fully embracing the uncertainty, assuming the most random weighting possible given what we know. Exactly. And this, this right here leads us to something pretty important in statistical mechanics, the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, the Boltzmann distribution. I feel like I've heard that somewhere in the depths of my physics classes, but remind me. All right, so imagine like a staircase. Okay. And each step is a different energy level a molecule could have. Okay, got it. The Boltzmann distribution, it tells us how likely we are to find a molecule on a particular step. So are they like just randomly bouncing around on these energy levels? There's randomness for sure, but the Boltzmann distribution gives us the probabilities. Oh. The higher the energy level, the less likely you are to find a molecule there. Like you're less likely to find someone hanging out on the top step of a super tall staircase. Mm. Makes sense. Less effort to stay on those lower steps. Yeah. But you mentioned temperature earlier. How does that factor in? Ah, great question. Temperature is key here. See, at high temperatures, the difference in probability between those high and low energy levels, it actually shrinks. Really? Yeah. It's like the molecules get more energetic, more likely to climb those metaphorical stairs. Oh. Things get more spread out, more random, you know, hotter. And at low temperatures, I'm guessing it's the opposite. You got it. Lower energy levels are more popular. Okay. The molecules, they settle down, they get colder, more likely to hang out on those lower steps. Got it. So the Boltzmann distribution, it's basically a probability map of where those molecules are most likely to be based on the temperature. Or as Bayes puts it, coolness. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, this is starting to click now. So Boltzmann distribution tells us how those molecules are spread across the energy levels based on the temperature. Yeah. But how does that get us to the 23 bits of missing information in a hydrogen molecule? How do we jump from that to this? That, my friend, is where the equipartition theorem comes in. Okay. It tells us how the energy is distributed among all the different ways a molecule can move and vibrate. Ooh, okay. Physicists call those degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom. So, like, how many directions it can wiggle in or something. Exactly. A hydrogen molecule, it can zip around in 3D space. Okay. It can rotate. Think of it like a little dumbbell. Yeah. And it can even vibrate a little bit, like yeah. two balls on a spring. Got it. Got it. Each of those is a degree of freedom. And the equipartition theorem says that, on average, each of those degrees of freedom, they get the same amount of energy. And that energy, it's directly proportional to the temperature. So the hotter it gets, the more energy goes into each of those wiggles and jiggles. You got it. Yeah. And to bring it back to entropy, those extra degrees of freedom, they add to the missing information. Okay. The more ways a molecule can store energy, the more possibilities for its state, and boom, higher entropy. Okay, so we've got missing information, probability, these energy levels, degrees of freedom. It's a lot. But how do we calculate all this? How do we get from those concepts to that magical 23 bits? That's where the partition function comes in handy. The what function? You have to, you have to break that one down for me. Okay, so think of the partition function. Like, imagine it's this powerful tool, okay. this master key, all right. that unlocks all this information about a physical system when it's in thermal equilibrium. Okay. It might sound a bit intimidating. Yeah, a little bit. But really, it's just adding up the contributions from all the possible states that system could be in. All the possible states. So for the hydrogen molecule, that's all the ways it could be zipping around, rotating, vibrating. You got it. But here's the thing. We don't count those states equally. We weight them according to their Boltzmann factor. Okay, right, right. Because some of those states are more likely than others. Exactly. Higher energy states, less likely at a given temperature. The partition function knows that gives more weight to the more likely states. So it's like we're taking a census, but some people get more votes. Yeah, I like that. And the amazing thing is, from this one function, we can calculate a lot about a system. It's average energy, something called free energy, and most important for us, it's entropy. Hold on, free energy? Mm. Is that like a coupon for a free tank of hydrogen? 
Not quite. Think of it like your budget, some goes to the essentials. Yeah. And what's left over is your free energy to spend on fun stuff. I like that analogy. <laughs> All right. So how does this free energy tie back into entropy and how do we get to those concrete numbers like our 23 bits? So the partition function lets us calculate that free energy, okay. which is related to the number of accessible states. Exactly. And then once we have the free energy, we subtract it from the system's total energy. Remember the budget. Yeah, yeah. Do a little temperature related division and bam, we get entropy. Okay, a few steps there. But the key takeaway is the partition function, it bridges the gap between those abstract ideas the information, the probability, and the actual calculable entropy. You got it. It's especially useful when we're dealing with lots of particles, like in a gas, which brings us one step closer to those 23 bits. This is amazing stuff. But before we get to the hydrogen grand finale, uh, yes. there's one more thing. You said something last time about distinguishable versus indistinguishable particles. What's that all about? You're on top of it. So we've laid a lot of groundwork. Yeah. But this distinction... Crucial for applying these concepts to real gases, trust me, it makes those 23 bits even more meaningful. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. All right, last time we left off with this whole distinguishable versus indistinguishable particle thing, and I have a feeling this is going to be big for figuring out those 23 bits in the hydrogen molecule. You got a good feeling, that's right. So when we're thinking about a gas, right, we've got to consider if we can actually tell those molecules apart individually. Well, if they're all zipping around like crazy, I'm going to guess it's kind of tough to keep track. Exactly. In most cases, they're indistinguishable. Thing like identical twins, but on a microscopic level. Okay, so what difference does it make if we can't tell them apart? Why does that matter for entropy? So let's go back to our partition function, our handy-dandy state counting tool. Right. When we assume the particles are distinguishable, it's like we're giving each one a little name tag. Molecule hashtag one, molecule hashtag two, and so on. Okay, makes sense. But for the indistinguishable ones, swapping two of them doesn't actually give us a brand new state. Hmm. Okay. So it's like one of those spot the difference puzzles. Yeah. If you swap two things that look the same, it's still the same picture. You got it. Yeah. So if we treat them like they're different when they're not, we end up with too many states counted. We've overcounted. Exactly. Overcounted. And to fix that, we got to bring in some math. We divide that partition function by you. Ready for this? N factorial. N factorial. Hey, that's ringing a bell. That's where you multiply a number by all the whole numbers yeah. smaller than it. Right. So 4 factorial would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Which is coming 4. Yeah, okay. Got it. And we divide by N factorial, yeah. N being the number of particles. Yeah. And that magically fixes that overcounting problem. Like, yeah. we've counted each arrangement N factorial times too many. Okay, I think I'm following. But how does that change the entropy of the gas? Does it make it higher or lower if we can't tell those particles apart? That's the cool part. It actually lowers the entropy. Really? Why? I would have thought it'd be the opposite, like more randomness, more uncertainty, higher entropy. It seems counterintuitive, but think about it. By recognizing that they're indistinguishable, we're basically acknowledging that there are fewer distinct ways to arrange them. Fewer possibilities. Fewer possibilities, yeah. It's like some arrangements we thought were different are actually the same, reducing that missing information. It's all about how much we actually don't know about what's really going on. Exactly. And this leads us to a pretty famous equation in statistical mechanics, the sacker tetrode equation. It tells us the entropy of a certain kind of gas, an ideal monatomic gas, like helium. And it accounts for those indistinguishable particles. Okay, getting closer to our hydrogen molecule now. But hydrogen, that's diatomic, right? It's two hydrogen atoms, not just one. Does that change things? It adds a little complexity, but the main ideas are the same. We just got to think about the extra ways a diatomic molecule can move and store energy. Remember the degrees of freedom from before. Yeah, the whole zipping, rotating, vibrating thing, right? Exactly. So a molecule with two atoms, it's got more ways to wiggle around compared to just a single atom. More moving parts, more possibilities. So more degrees of freedom, that means even more missing information, more entropy. Exactly. And if we want to know the entropy of a diatomic gas like hydrogen, we got to account for those extra contributions. All right. I'm ready for the grand finale. How do we put it all together, this equation, the indistinguishable particles, the extra degrees of freedom to finally crack the case of the 23 bits? Okay. So at room temperature, those vibrations in the hydrogen molecule are pretty tiny. It's like the spring connecting those atoms is super stiff. You know, it needs a lot of energy to really get vibrating. But those rotations, that those are important. Okay. So we're focusing on the rotations. How many rotational degrees of freedom does a hydrogen molecule have? It's got two 
think of that dumbbell again, tumbling through space, we need two angles to describe how it's oriented. And the aquapartition theorem tells us each of those gets kT half of energy on average. Okay, two rotations, kT half each. That's an extra kT of energy we got to include. You got it. Add that to the energy from the translational motion. Use our Sacker tetrode equation. Subtract the free energy. Divide by temperature. And we're almost there. Almost. Yeah. What else is there? Just one last thing. Remember when we divided the partition function by n factorial for those indistinguishable particles? Yeah. Got to do something similar for the rotational states. Oh, right. To avoid that overcounting again. Exactly. We divide by the symmetry number this time. Hydrogen, you can rotate it 180 degrees, and it looks the same, so its symmetry number is 2. Divide by 2, because we've counted each rotation twice. You got it. <laughs> All right, so... Pieces in place, we can calculate that entropy. And when we convert those units to bits per molecule, drum roll. Don't leave me hanging. We get about 23 bits of missing information. No way. We actually did it. We solved for it. Incredible, right? That's amazing. We started with some basic ideas, information, randomness, messy rooms, and we ended up calculating this fundamental property of a hydrogen molecule. We know exactly where those 23 bits are coming from. This has been such an amazing journey. I feel like I've leveled up my understanding of, well, everything. And this is just the beginning. Really? Those 23 bits, those tiny little molecules, they hold clues to some of the biggest mysteries out there. Black holes, the arrow of time. It's mind-blowing. Who knew a single hydrogen molecule could be so deep? A huge thanks to our expert for walking us through this amazing deep dive into the world of entropy. We'll see you next time, everyone. Keep those brains buzzing, there's always more to explore.